We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 4, 14, and go through 5, 11 today. Because all of these passages, they're just so rich. We could preach a lifetime on the book of Hebrews and still have more in this book. It's just so rich. But let's... Turn to there if you have your Bible, Hebrews 4, 14 through Hebrews 5, 11. Again, I may not read the entire passage, but you have hopefully your Bible there so you can glance down over it and do some reading on your own. But let's start in verse 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now we saw last week that those words seen then are important. Because the words seen then are tied to what came a few verses before, where it said that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. We really need the, the Word of God to have proper eyesight, don't we? Now, the Word of God will show us two things. First of all, it'll show us our true condition. Second of all, it'll show us God's true condition. And both of those are real important, aren't they? I'm not one of those guys that think... The law is unimportant, but I am one of those guys that believes what the Bible says that we're not under law. Amen? Amen? The law is important because the law shows us our true condition. And the law is, is important when used lawfully. Remember, we're told that the law was a schoolmaster that was to lead us to Christ. Now, if the law is used for that purpose, the law is good. But that doesn't mean I'm under the law. Because what I'm under is Jesus. We talked earlier about how in the Old Testament, there's only about 15 times approximately where God is called the Father. And in the New Testament, there's probably upwards of 200 times where God is called our Father. That's because we're in Christ. We're under Christ. We're not under the law. But the Word does help us to, first of all, see our true condition. How many of you know that if we look at ourselves, the way that we look apart from Christ, it doesn't look good? It doesn't look pretty. The way you wake up in the morning before you paint your face or whatever, hopefully it's all women here that do that, but you know, however you look in the morning before you do that, it looks a lot better than how you look in your true condition without Jesus. But I'll tell you what, when you put on Jesus, you become beautiful. You become absolutely beautiful. I've had many times when I've been in a church service, and the presence of God has come in. Usually it's during worship when people's hearts are open and they're praising the Lord. And you look around and just people look so beautiful. Have you ever noticed that? How beautiful people look when the glory of God is resting upon them? The Holy Spirit makes us look beautiful, doesn't He? And the Word of God is powerful. So the Word of God helps us see our true condition. And that's why sometimes it's not a conflicting report there are many things I'll admit I don't understand about the Bible, but it's not a conflicting report to on the one hand say that I'm a sinner saved by grace because I am a sinner apart from grace. Amen? But it's also not a conflicting report on the other hand to say I'm a saint that's saved by grace because my identity has changed. I don't identify anymore as a sinner. I identify as a saint because of the blood of Jesus. Do you see that? How those things sound different? But they're not because the Word shows our true condition. And then the Word shows us God's true condition. And this is why seeing then that we have such a great high priest. When our eyes are open, we find out Jesus is a great high priest. You know what? The more our eyes are open to Jesus, the more we see what He's been doing for us. Would you agree with that? I mean, the more we see that He's been standing in the gap for us, loving us, interceding for us. Uh, you guys, I'm sure you all remember what it was like to be a child, or be a teenager especially, and you just don't see things like your parents see things, do you? Not one bit. That's just part of growing up. Matter of fact, the logic center of the brain doesn't develop until you're in your mid-20s to early 30s. So if you say, why do young people do so many illogical things? They really do, because that part of the brain isn't developed yet. And so did we. <laughs> That's just part of growing up. That's just part of the physiology of growing up. There are things we don't understand. We're, but if we're growing up in Christ... If we're growing up in Jesus, 
there ought to be things that we understand better today than we understood 20 years ago. Amen? Would you agree with that? Seen then, the Word helps us to understand God's true condition. The closer we grow to Christ, the more we see who God is, the more we understand Him, the more we're able to see then that we have a great high priest. I've had many encounters with people that I've just flat out misjudged because maybe their mannerisms were like someone that I knew before that had the same mannerisms or they had a similar look to someone that I knew before that had that look and didn't have very good character. You know what I'm talking about? And then you begin to get to know that person and you start to feel convicted. I was completely wrong. That person, he may look like the guy I used to know, but his character is completely different than the guy. I, I, you know what I'm talking about? When you get to know a person and discover their character, have you also noticed how the source of who says something matters? You know what I'm talking about. Somebody says a comment to you and you get offended. And a person that you respect says the same comment to you and you receive it. Why? Because you know the character of that person. And you know that that person has your best intentions at heart. Seeing then that we have such a great high priest. The word allows us to see our true condition. It allows us to see the true condition of Jesus. And it allows us to understand that we have a great high priest. He's on our side. Jesus is on our side. And it says, seeing then that we have such a great high priest, let us then hold fast our confession. But seeing then that we have a great high priest. It's going to look like I'm leaving out a big chunk by skipping the verse about coming boldly before the throne, but we spent a long time on that last week. If you want to hear that, get the CD from last week and fast forward to that part. First of all, the fact is that Jesus has passed through the heavens and therefore we're exhorted to hold fast. What does that mean? Why are we told to hold fast our confession because Jesus passed through the heavens? Well, there are many things we could say about that. But let me say that one of the main reasons that we should hold fast our confession because Jesus has passed through the heavens is because we now have a human representative there. We now have someone that can sympathize with us in our weaknesses, in our sins, in our struggles, in our difficulties. He's sympathetic to our cause. We have a human representative. And not only is he our intercessor before the throne, he's the very king that we're told that God is going to put all things under his feet. God himself chose who our representative was going to be. But because God is such a loving father, he gave us a human representative in the person of Jesus who has passed through the heavens. That means we've got someone who understands. Can you say amen to that? We have someone who understands the passions of our flesh. We have someone who understands the temptations that we're going to pass through on this earth. Therefore, let us hold fast our confession. What that's saying to us is that because we got someone that can sympathize with us in the highest echelons of God's government, the very top of God's government, can sympathize with us in our human condition, because of that, we can come to God boldly and we can expect to find an advocate in Jesus. We got an advocate. God is on our side. Amen. Now, He didn't give the angels a representative. And if someday they find out that there are little Martian men living under the surface, He didn't give the Martians a representative. He gave humanity a representative in the highest courts of God. And not only is He the, the King Eternal, but He's also an interceder that's standing in the gap on our behalf. He's sympathetic to us. So we should come boldly before the throne. I'm not going back to that verse, but this is kind of tied to that. Because Jesus has ascended and gone through the heavens. Let us hold fast our confession. Well, what does that mean to you and me? Let me illustrate it this way. If you're hanging off a cliff and you're looking down at all of the death and the destruction. Now, Physically, we're talking about a cliff that you could be dropped off of, but let's spiritualize it. And you're looking down at all of the temptations, you know, all of the worldliness, all of the things. The, and not just that, but the sickness, the disease, eternal death, uh, you know, uh, error, <laughs> doctrinal error, you know, even, you know, alcoholism and drug abuse and sexual immorality. And you're looking down at all these things, but when you look up, you see that there's somebody holding your hand on that cliff and he's trying to pull you up. 
Now, it's good to know that that person's on your side, isn't it? That when you know that the hand you're holding on to is on your side, let me ask you this question. In all of the difficulty, struggle, and dangers, would that make you hold that hand less or hold that hand more? We'd hold on all the tighter, wouldn't we? Pull me up, Jesus. Get me up out of this stuff. Uh, you know, we wouldn't loosen our grip just because there's difficulty. We would tighten that grip because you understand, you care about me, you're on my side, you're there to lift me up. See, Jesus is there to lift us up to heavenly places in Him. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> He understands since he's passed through, since we got a representative in the highest level of God's courts, and he's holding our hand, pulling us up. Let us hold all the more fast our confession. Well, let's get practical about that. I'm going to go back last week, you know, and I'm going to pick on Larry one more time. Sorry, Larry. You're just a good target. <laughs> all right. You can correct me if I'm wrong. You were talking about how you came off of drugs and you'd wake up with the shakes and so forth. And I've heard. You know, I've heard other people with that testimony. But you wake up with the shakes and with that, that strong impulse. Now, our human tendency is to say, God, I can't make it. I can't get through this. I can't go on another night like this. But when you're in the difficulty, if you understand that God is on your side, what that will do is it will make you hold tighter to the hand of Jesus. You know, you were talking about the Rich Mullins video, which I haven't seen the movie yet. But we were blessed to see one of Rich Mullins' last concerts that he ever did before he died in that, that car accident. He sang the, the song, Hold Me Jesus, I'm Shaking Like a Leaf. He was talking about that, his struggle as a believer, yet with addiction. And yet he was struggling with that. And I remember in that concert, when we all started to praise the Lord because the Spirit of God came in and the Spirit was moving. And uh, he wasn't a, quote, Pentecostal. He was a Nazarene, okay? And he, you could tell that he was struggling because everyone was raising their hands and they were singing out. And he just felt, he felt overwhelmed. And I found out later, after that, that it was because he felt his own inadequacy. How could God be using me to lead these people in worship? If they only knew my struggles, how could... And, but see, that doesn't make us hold less to the hand of Jesus. It ought to make us hold tighter because He's on our side. He understands. He didn't sin. He was without sin, we're going to see as we go through this passage. But yet, He's on our side. Friends, when we begin to see God as He really is, it makes us hold fast our confession. It makes us hold tighter to the hand of Jesus. And then we're exhorted there also in that verse to come boldly before the throne. As I've said, I'm not recovering that ground. But let me just say this. If you know that Jesus is interceding for you and He's on your side, will you come more boldly before the throne or more sheepishly before the throne? Boldly, because He's there to help you. He's on your side. He's our deliverance. But we've got to see him as he really is. And the way we see that way is through the word. Well, let's look at verses uh, 1 through 10 of chapter 5. And we're going to see here that there's going to be a contrast drawn between an earthly high priest and a heavenly high priest. Both are called by God, but Jesus is uniquely qualified to be the high priest of God. How many of you know it's good not just to have someone that can sympathize with you, but he's qualified? Isn't that good? He's qualified. You know, God didn't get second best here. He sent His best. God called and enlisted the best to be our advocate, to be our high priest. We'll start in verse 1 of chapter 5. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honor on himself, but he who is called by God just as Aaron was. Now we've got to stop there because this is talking about earthly high priests. 
This is talking about people. This is not talking about Jesus in these first first four verses. We see the grace of God at work even in the Old Testament. Before Jesus came in the flesh, before Jesus died, was resurrected, and ascended to the right hand of the Father, before all that happened, God still gave us a human representative to come before His presence. But the way that it worked was the priests were called from the tribe of Levi, and then there was one high priest each year that was called to go make sacrifice for sins, and he had to make sacrifice for his own sins, because how many of you know even the best wasn't perfect? And then he would go after he made sacrifice for his sins, and he would make sacrifice for all the people. So God was still graciously giving us a human representative, but it just wasn't the best yet. The best was yet to come. Those that were out of the line of Aaron, they were called of God, but they just weren't yet the best that was to come. Now, let's just go on a little bit. Jesus is qualified as the high priest because he was called of the Father. There's so many things I can say about the first four four verses. Speaking of the priest of Aaron, I'm not going to do that at this time, other than to acknowledge that they were from the tribe of Levi, There was still a human representative, but the best was yet to come. Now look at verse number 5, speaking of Jesus. So Christ also did not glorify Himself to become high priest. But it was He who said to Him, You are My Son, today I have begotten You. As He also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we're going to come back to that in a, uh, about a week or two and talk about Melchizedek, because that's going to take some time. So verse 7, "...who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and having been perfected, he became author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. We see here that Jesus was qualified more than the priesthood of Aaron was. And what we see here is that we're told that no man takes this honor upon himself, but he is called of God. God in His mercy allows us and gives us human systems to help us, but God is not subject to those systems Himself. Okay, let's talk, let's think about the the earthly priesthood. Uh, The uh, priest of Aaron, those that were from the tribe of Levi. Do you think any of them ever probably campaigned to be the high priest? Or to be in in the upper, upper echelon? I'm pretty sure they did, because human nature hasn't changed the last time... I checked. Well, do people campaign in the church today to be the pastor of the biggest church sometimes? Or to be on a certain board or to be a certain type of leader? Some do that, don't they? And some of them are actually qualified because they have what it takes. Not everybody could do it. Our current president, and this is not political this morning, I'm only illustrating. I hope you understand that. I probably would struggle to find even one thing that he's done that I would agree with just being honest. Yet, if I'm also honest, he's probably doing his job better than I would do his job. I think I could do his job better, but if I really could do his job better, then I would probably have his job. I mean, honestly, think about it. We say, well, I could govern better than him. Well, probably, but there's a lot more to being president than just governing. It starts with getting elected. So he must have been pretty good at that or else he wouldn't be there. Are are you following me here? In human systems, they're not bad. I believe that democracy is the best system that we can have apart from the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Christ is better. Amen? But as long as flawed men are sitting on the throne, then democracy is the best because we can get rid of some of them. All right? Get them out of the way uh, without having outright war or something. You know, you can elect, you can vote when it works right. I know the system doesn't always work right. This isn't political. I'm not getting into all that today. My whole point being that human systems are good, but they can be manipulated. But God is not subject to human systems. That's why we see here that Jesus was called as a high priest out of the order of Melchizedek. No one could ever say that Jesus was just good at manipulating the people, so he became the high priest. 
because Jesus wasn't even qualified according to the earthly system. He wasn't even from the tribe of Levi. He was from the tribe of Judah. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So what God did, God allowed out of his grace this earthly system, which was the best thing going at the time. Let me tell you, if I lived in the Old Testament, I would be Jewish by choice. Because you could be a proselyte Jew. Let me tell you, it was the best thing going at the time. And I would be that. If I, but thank God that I don't, didn't live then. Thank God that he ordained this day for me and that I can be a Christian. Amen? Saved by the, the blood of Jesus. But Jesus didn't rise through the ranks of the earthly system. The earthly system would have never recognized or acknowledged Jesus as good as the earthly system was for its day. God had another order, and it's called the order of Melchizedek. Now, we really just don't have time to get into what all that means this morning. But if you remember, Melchizedek, it says he was without father or mother. What that's saying is we don't know his father or mother. Uh, Melchizedek, the man, had to have a father and mother. But we don't know his father and mother. They're unknown. And yet, Melchizedek was a man that Abraham came and made sacrifices to and gave offerings to. We're going to get into this a little more detail in a couple weeks. And we're saying that Jesus is a man out of a higher order, out of a more perfect system. How many of you know that as good as the old ways are, that if there's a better way that God has instituted, you would do good to follow it? I, you know, if, if I lived 150 years ago, I would want a horse. I would, I would want a horse and I would want a plow, wouldn't you? Maybe even an ox and a plow. I mean, because it would probably be the best thing going. Put it in my garden, I would be grateful for a, a horse and a plow 150 years ago. And I would probably take great effort and make great sacrifice to get one if I wanted a good garden. Wouldn't you? But living today, I'm grateful for a rotiller. And it just cost me 150 bucks in gas. I mean, I'm grateful for that. You see, it doesn't mean the horse... And, and the plow was bad, but it means that something better has come along. It doesn't negate the fact that the horse and the plow was good for its day. The same principles of gardening are going to exist then as exist now, but something better has come. That's what we're being told here. Jesus didn't just rise through the ranks, but God uh, created a, a new higher order while well, He had it Actually, it's, it's an order that existed before the earthly order. We're going to get into that later. The priesthood of Aaron, God instituted out of his mercy because it was the best thing going on in the earth that day. But actually, the order of Melchizedek predates the order of the Levitical priesthood. And we're going to see that as we go on here. That it says, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek while Levi was still in his loins. You see, the way of Jesus was from the foundations of the world. God always had this plan to redeem us and to make a better way. But until the fullness of that day came, in His mercy, He gave us the best thing the earth had to offer. I don't travel as much as some people, but I've traveled quite a bit. I still feel like America is the best thing the earth has to offer at the moment. So I'm glad to live in America with all of its problems, with all of its difficulties. It's still the best thing the earth has to offer. But how many of you know that when the heavenly kingdom comes, I'm going to put off America like an old sackcloth, like an old rag, and I'm not going to look back. And, and when Jesus' rule and reign and kingdom is established completely upon the earth, I'm going to wholeheartedly serve Jesus, and I'm never going to give one more thought to who's going to be president. Because something better is coming. It doesn't negate that right now, America's the best thing, in my opinion, that we have going. It doesn't negate that. But when something better comes along, especially when it's something that has existed before what we have here and now, uh, we need to recognize that. So Jesus is qualified because He was called of the Father. Before the foundations of the earth, He was called. Uh, Open Bible is going to be putting out a curriculum that looks fabulous about the call of God. They're, you know, they're returning to some principal value type things that they feel like we need in this day and hour. And it just looks fabulous. And uh, the call of God. You know, we don't talk about the call of God very much anymore, do we? That's what this passage is talking about. The call of God. The, all of humanity could overlook you. The whole system could overlook you. But if God calls you and you say yes to God, something powerful can happen. 
all of these guys. Jesus would have never been accepted by the Levitical priesthood. Peter would have never been accepted. Paul, Paul was accepted, but then he was rejected when he came to faith in Christ, right? God has this way of finding the people that fall between the cracks. We had a speaker at National Convention from Chicago. His last name is De Jesus. You might have seen him on 700 Club and some of those things. But he's a pastor that he was declared by Time Magazine to be one of the 100 most influential people on the earth. A pastor. He's an Assembly God pastor. Uh, the Lord has really used him to bring a lot of change in Chicago. You know, and he was talking about how it's just a God thing that God has given him that influence because he certainly don't have the background for it. He was a, a drug guy, a gang guy, all that type of stuff. When he was a youth, he didn't have an earthly father. They had rejected him and all this stuff. I don't want to go through his whole story, but he gets saved in a little Pentecostal church, but he stays in that church for about 20 years. He just serves as like assistant pastor and, and various things like that. And then one day the call comes, you know, and they ask him, would you please be the pastor? And he said, okay, I'll be the pastor. And God used him in that, that church that was stagnant for years and the Lord used this guy that when he took over, it's one of the fastest growing churches in America now in Chicago. And he sat there for 20 years. Talk about a late bloomer. How, how many of you know that if you've been in a church for 20 years and change hasn't come, then they're probably not looking to you for change, right? Uh, and, and not only that, but he's one of the most hundred influential people in the world, according to Time magazine. And he said, I don't, he said they called us in for the photo op. And I, I just, you know, I was standing by uh, all the rock stars and all these influential you know, worldly people, and here's a pastor standing in the midst. He said to his wife, he said, do we really belong here? But he was talking about how Chicago, under their current leadership, was going, uh, enough said, was going to start a gay high school. They were going to, because uh, the, the, of all the persecution of gay people. And word came down to him, and he called, not the mayor, but it was a friend of his that's on the council that's not saved, and he said, we got to meet in the park. He said, that's how we do things in Chicago. We meet in the park. <laughs> he almost sounds like a mafia type guy, this pastor. It's, so, and, and he called him and he said, he said you know, we got to talk. You need to understand. Like it or not, God has made me an influential person. And he gives God the credit for that. And he said, I'm going to tell you, if you go ahead with plans on this gay high school, we're going to have a fight on our hands. Because I'm not going to just stand here and let you do this to Chicago. You're misrepresenting our city. The guy resisted. But then, you know, the, the church prayed. They believe a lot in prayer. And uh, he got a call a few days later saying, well, we're not going to go ahead with the gay high school. Well, because he told him, he said, you can start a high school for the, the uh, persecuted gays, but then I'm going to need about 30 of them for the persecuted Christians that are in their school. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to need, you know, uh, one for the transgender, and I'm go because most of them aren't gay, believe it or not. Most transgenders, 90% of them are not gay. They just have an identity crisis. Uh, and he said, I'm going to need all of these different schools that you're going to have to start. Do you really want this fight on your hands? So they called him back and said, we're just going to not do the <laughs> gay high school thing. But these are people who would have ever thought, if you, I don't know, if you go back 40 years or whatever in this guy's life, who would have ever thought that this little zip-faced drug addict punk in inner city Chicago would be one of the most hundred influential people in the world, according to Time Magazine today. Who would have ever thought such a thing? But God is in the, that kind of business. That's what God does. The people that have been overlooked, the people that have fallen through the cracks, if God calls and they say, yes, something powerful happens. Now, I know that Jesus is God, but I also know that God had to say yes to himself. And there must have been times when he was looking and saying, do I really want to go through with this? We know that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, don't we? When Jesus prayed to the Father, I don't want to die, but Lord, if you're willing, you know, let it pass from me, but your will, not my will be done. See, all we got to do is say yes. I like this pastor. He said, you know, we talk about David and Goliath. But he said all David had to do was show up and throw the stone up in the air. God had amen and put the force behind it. God's just looking for someone that will say yes. Amen. Jesus said yes. Though he was a son. Though he was eternally, before time began, the son of God. Jesus said yes to die on our behalf. Amen. To be tempted as we're tempted. He's qualified. Why is he qualified? Because God called him and because he said yes. That's why Jesus is qualified. 
The Word says there's nothing about Him that would draw any man un- unto Him. Naturally. Let me tell you, friends, that's why we're qualified. Now, we're not against human systems because if they're used lawfully and properly, they're there for our good, aren't they? Aren't they? I mean, uh, you know, actually, one of the other priests that was not of the, the Levitical priesthood was Moses' father-in-law. Did you know that? He was not Jewish, and he was not of the, so he was not of the Levitical priesthood. And it says of Moses' father-in-law that he was a priest. He was obviously a priest who feared God, I mean, we see that from Scripture. And he gave Moses a wonderful human system. If you remember how, you know, Moses was overwhelmed and his father-in-law with wisdom said, well, you know, distribute the responsibilities, delegate the responsibilities. It was a great system. God is not against the systems if the systems honor God. And if God tells us here at Open, Ithaca Open Bible, institute such and such system, if that helps reach people for Jesus, praise God. If, the, if it's used lawfully, it's a good thing. But let us never forget that God always has the final word. And what it comes down to is the call of God. Did God say do it? And when he said do it, did we say yes to it? Because we can have, we could have, you know, Saddleback, the, you know, or, or Joel Osteen's system or whatever, you know, big church we want to have system here. And it could be working on our behalf. But if God says do something and somebody just down the road says yes, God will raise that person up to do it. Because it's the call of God that matters most of all. Jesus was called of God and He said yes to the Heavenly Father. Therefore, He was a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Which, again, we'll come back and speak to that later. He was qualified because of that call. He was qualified, we're told here in verse 7, because of His godly fear or godly reverence. Could you agree that godly fear and reverence is missing from much of the church today? A lot of people can speak real good and they can wear their dirty jeans and look real contemporary and spike their hair. Nothing wrong with that. (laughs) But godly fear is missing. I understand how quick this could descend into unnecessary criticism. So I don't want to get stuck here very long. But I think if any of us have visited very many churches, we've been to a few where the whole worship service had nothing to do with Jesus. It was just inspirational music. You know what I'm talking about? And a very inspirational message, but really there was nothing life-changing in the message, even though the message was inspirational. But we're told here that what qualified Jesus... Okay, we saw that God called him, and Jesus said yes. Now we see that his godly fear and reverence qualified him. How many of you know that godly fear and reverence is important? It, you know, God is our buddy. God is our partner. God is our friend. He's all these things we can see in Scripture. He's our brother. You know, he's all these things. But there are times when we need to learn to recognize godly reverence. That's a lot of what's going to be happening uh, in the tribulation, Revelation 4, through the end of uh, the book of Revelation, Jesus' takeover, physical takeover of the kingdoms of this earth, what a lot of that is, is going to be about is not who has the best worship service. It's going to be about godly reverence. Do you really fear God? And if you fear Him, are you ready to fear Him with your life? We had a powerful speaker uh, at one of the, one of the sessions. I don't, I don't remember the guy's name. But man, it was powerful. And God convicted me. He was talking about the importance of a clean life. And on Father's Day today, this illustration works well, I think. He said, and I'm going to give you something that is going to help you live a more clean, wife, more clean life with your spouse. Are you ready for this? And so we're all, we're all listening. What is it? He said, do you have the revelation that you're a son of God? That's real good to know, isn't it? That we're a son of God. That we're not just some servant, we're a son of God. He said, that's good, but now there's a deeper side to that revelation. Do you also realize that God's not just your father, he's your (laughs) father-in-law? Now, he was talking to men when he said this, and I just felt the Holy Ghost work all through me. (laughs) Interesting, my father-in-law's here today, but I just... Would we treat our spouse different if we realized... You see, sometimes we get empowered 
I'm a son of God. We, and we do need that. That is a valid revelation. We need, I'm a son of God. I ain't the scum of the earth. I'm not just some old sinner anymore. I'm a saint saved by grace. I'm a son of God. But how clean would our life be, men, if we started thinking of ourselves as the son-in-law of God? Would that affect how we treat our wives? I think it would. And women, too. It applies both ways, but especially to men. Because, you see, the person we're married to as a guy, that's God's daughter. Are we going to mistreat God's daughter and then walk up to God and ask him to bless us? I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine abusing a man's daughter and then walking up to him thinking you're going to be blessed by him? Get the revelation of sonship, yes, but also realize that God's our father-in-law, and you guys ought to feel convicted. <laughs> I, feel, I still am getting the Holy Ghost goosebumps just repeating it to you. And I made a renewed commitment to the Lord. And I went back to the hotel room, and I pulled Delany to my side, and I said, Delany, I'm making a renewed commitment to you. I want to live a clean life, and I want to treat you the way that you should be treated. And yet when we get real, Jesus said, if you just look at a woman to lust after her, to God, that's just the same as committing adultery. I'm not trying to focus so heavy on the men on Father's Day here, because it applies to women too. Just men are more visual. And I said, Lord, I want to make a renewed commitment to live a clean life. And I said to Delany, I need your help to do that. I need your help to do that. And uh, she understands that. This is what marked the life of Jesus was his godly reverence. When the prostitute was wiping his feet with her tears and her hair, when everyone else was looking and saying, just the prostitute, some of them might have been looking. You know, maybe they had been with her before. I don't know. She was a prostitute. I don't know. And Jesus, though, when he looked at her, saw a daughter of God. That's what this is talking about, this godly reverence. It wasn't just when he was in church. It was when he was out on the street with that drug dealer that everybody else had written off, but Jesus saw a son of God. He saw a son. The guy just hasn't realized it yet. This is what it's talking about, this godly reverence. You say, how can we do this? How can we live this kind of a clean life? Well, we certainly couldn't do it on our own, but if we understand that Jesus has passed through the heavens and that he's sympathetic, though he didn't sin, he was tempted in all the ways that were tempted. Do you think a woman never threw herself at the feet of Jesus? I mean, honestly, do you think that... Now, they may not have had drugs like we have them now. Uh, it's the Greek word uh, sorcery. It's interchangeable. So sorcery and drugs are in the same category. Uh, do you think that... that sorcerers and, you know, alcoholics and whatever, never tried to put Jesus in a place of temptation. He was tempted in every way like we're tempted. In every way like we're tempted. Yet he didn't sin. You don't have to sin to understand what a person's going through, but you do have to be tempted like they were tempted. Under you know, Jesus knows what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night with those shakes. Do you know he knows that he felt that? And though he didn't sin, he felt those shakes. And the, that, that uh, an addict coming off would feel. Godly reverence. This isn't some game. <laughs> We're not talking about being condemned because we have to see him as he truly is, seeing then that we have such a great high priest. We need to realize that God is on our side. God wants you to win that victory. He's invested everything. Jesus is qualified because of his reverence. Because of his godly reverence, he recognizes that you're a son and a daughter of God. You see, that's what's cool about Jesus. I would think that if I was Jesus, I would feel pretty entitled. How about you? I mean, I'm Jesus. Give me a break. And yet, Jesus recognizes that's my sister. That's my brother. I may be the son of God, but because he came in the flesh, he looks at you as my sister. You as my brother. And he's always thinking that way. I mean, I don't know. It's not a Bible saying, but we say it a lot. Blood is thicker than water. Isn't it? We're in Jesus' bloodline. He's not looking at you as some enemy anymore. 
He's looking at you at his brother, at his sister. You see, Jesus understands this. This is what godly reverence is speaking about. Very quickly, the rest of these. It says, uh, Jesus is a qualified high priest because of his humble obedience. Godly reverence will manifest in humble obedience. Say this with me because it's worth saying. Godly reverence will manifest in humble obedience. Matter of fact, that's how we know if we really fear God or not. If it will produce humble obedience on our behalf. This old saying that we used to say all the time, there but for the grace of God go I. I have four older brothers. And they've all had their struggles. To my knowledge, they've all been divorced. Many of them have had issues with substance abuse and alcohol uh, and uh, various other things. Is there any reason that I shouldn't have had all the same struggles that they had? Not, not a reason except for Jesus. Only Jesus. And I'm not acting like I haven't done things wrong up here. But you see, humble obedience is a manifestation of godly reverence. I could be right in that jail cell where my brother's at today. I could be right there, but for the grace of God. I don't know about you, but I fear a God. And I'm talking about respect and reverence. And I rejoice in a God who loved me enough. Well, I did say yes to him. And my brother needs to say yes to him. But God loves him just as much as he loves me. You see... Humble obedience is godly reverence. One thing, uh, it's, he says here, of whom, hey, this is timely, verse 11, uh, of whom we have much to say, but it's hard to explain because you've become dull of hearing. Well, sometimes uh, the seat of your pants can't, it can't, the seat of your pants can't endure the learning. And that's what the writer of Hebrews has here, and he says similar things several times. You know, he's just looking for hungry people, but he says you've become dull of hearing. You, you've stopped listening. You've stopped learning. You've stopped growing. And uh, one of the traits of many prophetic people is they tend to get wordy. And that, that's really actually biblical. Uh, I ha- wrote down a couple scriptures here. Acts 15.23 says Judas and Silas. That's not Judas Iscariot. But it says that they themselves were prophets and so they said much <laughs> to encourage the people. And we know Paul often said much. But when the Spirit's flowing, there's so much revelation. There's so much stuff. I'm going to tell you, there's stuff. I prepare and I study and all this, but I, I, I teach or I preach these messages, and then sometime around I come back and I edit these messages, and I hear stuff flowing out of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that I'm like, wow, how did I say that? That's Holy Ghost. And I learn for myself because I'm learning from the Holy Ghost. But so often our hearing becomes dull, doesn't it? Do you ever get tired of uh, listening? I know kids get tired of listening to their parents, don't they? And I don't know, as a dad, the best thing I have to say is still to come. And yet my kids are tired of listening by then. Amen? It's the same way in church, isn't it? The best is yet to come. But I, I understand. So uh, there's much that could be said of this, both in Hebrews and of expounding upon it. But it is Father's Day, so we'll tie it up. Uh, just in closing, recognize this. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation. Verse 9 says, Having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who will obey him. The word perfected, as you probably know, is actually the word matured. Okay, It doesn't mean Jesus was imperfect, but there's a fullness of time. When things had come to the maturity, he was the author of eternal salvation. Everything was always working towards that. Okay, That was always the plan of the ages, was was Jesus and salvation. But here's the cool thing. Jesus authored it. When, see, when we go back to this, and we'll conclude with this, seeing then that we have such a great high priest, when you realize that Jesus was the author of this thing, how many of you know that a plan is much better when you put your own skin into it? It's always easy. I always say it's always easy to fix someone else's marriage or someone else's church, isn't it? We went to a church on vacation. Closing illustration here. We went to a church on vacation. It was very good worship. The preaching was very good. But the setup was just so disorderly. I don't want to mention it here, but it's the one I told you I was going to go to. It was just total unwelcoming because of the setup. 
And I thought, man, if they would just put some signs up saying bathroom this way, nursery this way, you know, welcome snacks this way. It just, or if they just put a greeter at the door. I know they, they couldn't really, they didn't have the money at the moment to change their facilities, what someone had said. And it was just a setup problem. But just some signs would fix it, you know, or just some greeters at the door would fix it. And <laughs> just some simple things like that. But how many of you know it's easy to fix that guy's church, right? <laughs> and he could probably come here and fix Ithaca because that church is probably 10 times, the size, well, at least 20 times the size of Ithaca on a good Sunday, all right? So I'm sure that he could come and fix a lot of things about Ithaca too. But how many of you know it's different when your skin is in the game? I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God didn't just tell us how to fix it. You know what the law does? It tells us how to fix it. <laughs> but it leaves us powerless to do so. But Jesus put his skin in the game. He was the author of our eternal salvation. He planned this whole thing out. And he said, not only will I tell him how to fix it, but I will step into human flesh. I will die on your behalf. And then I will be seated at the right hand of the Father to eternally intercede for you on your behalf. I'm in this thing all the way through. And that word, that wording is not a coincidence. He's not just the author of salvation. He's the author of eternal salvation. How many of you are glad that Jesus is in this thing forever and ever and ever and ever? In spite of all of our flaws and all of our faults and all of our weaknesses, Jesus is in this thing. Yeah. <laughs> He's at our side. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Hallelujah. Stand with me if you would as we conclude.